This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lockwell here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Bank earnings in the spotlight. Deutsche Bank and Unicredit lift their revenue outlooks as higher rates boost trading. For Barclays, it's a miss. Big tech battered Microsoft, Alphabet, and Texas Instruments tumble after hours as weak earnings hit some of the world's top tech companies. Plus, new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak appoints his cabinet as a time reports he may delay next, next week's fiscal statement. So first thing is first, let's check on the markets. We actually opened lower after that uh, slide because of tech earnings. A lot of questions on whether we've seen the worst of the sell-off. Reminder, we've lost $5.5 trillion um, since the beginning of the year. And the question is whether that nears a bottom. European stocks, you can see pretty much flat to banks, maybe a little bit under pressure, down some three-tenths of 8%. Although Deutsche Bank or Danny Burgers in Frankfurt bring us that interview. Uh, they did better than expected on a lot of metrics. Certainly, their traders did better than a lot of the Wall Street banks. U.S. 10-year yield, 4.04, and then the dollar index, 1321. The picture overall is not only one of earnings, and we do see a bit of volatility when it comes to that, but a lot of it is also what we do with central banks. So the ECB, of course, based in Frankfurt, comes out with an interest rate hike tomorrow, then a week after it's the Bank of England here in the U.K. And then I would also watch this country, Italy, down some two-tenths of 8% for the market. At the moment, not really latching on to that, but we had the first speech of Giorgia Meloni in Parliament yesterday, and she really went after the ECB, saying they should not hike rates. Uh, one of uh, the feistiest speech against the central bank, certainly from a G7 country. Now, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has named most, most of his cabinet, confirming Jeremy Hunt will remain Chancellor of the Exchequer, but Downing Street was unable to confirm if Hunt would stick to his plan to outline the government's spending and tax strategy on October 31st. Now, outside number 10, Sunak reiterated the tough economic challenges the country faces. Right now, our country is facing a profound economic crisis. The aftermath of COVID still lingers. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets and supply chains the world over. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, Richie Sunak appears to have kept his friends close, his enemies closer in his cabinet appointments. What does this say about how much experience he wants in his administration? Well, he's rewarded experience, but also a firm nod to party unity. He's kept the same three holders of the great offices of state that Truss had just a week ago. Uh, and it's really avoiding the mistake that she made of surrounding himself with loyalists, though ironically that means that he is now surrounded by Truss allies. Uh, it also means that they don't need time to settle in. As you say, Jeremy Hunt is staying at the Treasury. He can deal with the crisis from the get go. And instead, Sunak has had to reward his allies with positions lower down the pecking order. So, for example, Mel Stride, his campaign chief, takes uh, work and pensions. But that is an important role at this stage, given the debate over whether benefits should rise in line with inflation. And Mel Stride has indicated that he favours that should happen. It also means that Suella Braverman remains Home Secretary uh, just six days after she was sacked for breach, breaking the ministerial code, just after Sunak has said that he's going to rule with integrity. Uh, but it's the result of him having to do a deal with the Tory right. That could be a point that is picked up at Prime Minister's questions by Keir Starmer today. And it also means no promotion for Penny Mordaunt, uh, perhaps punishment for not conceding till the very last minute in the leadership race. So, Lizzie, it's the first face-off. Prime Minister's questions between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. What do you expect? Well, it's billed as boring versus boring, Francine. But that's a welcome thing for many in Westminster and around the country, that we've got this new era of British politics, uh, mercifully, many would say. One of Labour's main criticisms of Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor, the line used to be, uh, we'd do the same thing, but we, we would do more of it and faster. Uh, so it may be more difficult for Starmer to oppose Sunak. I would expect, as I say, uh, 
criticism of the reappointment of Trust allies like Suella Braverman. Uh, she, uh, it would suggest that uh, Sunak agrees with the policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda when Sunak has promised compassion. Uh, but Sunak really headed off a lot of the criticism you would expect Sunak, uh, Starmer to make today. For example, calls for a general election uh, by saying in his speech in Downing Street yesterday that he's going to deliver on Johnson's mandate from 2019, hence the, the references to Brexit, levelling up the National Health Service. He addressed the concerns about his predecessor's mistakes and the, the concerns as well that he's too rich to deal with uh, people's uh, real struggles in this cost of living crisis. But interestingly, a YouGov poll says that two thirds of people continue to think that Rishi Sunak is out of touch with ordinary people. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest on the UK. Now let's get straight to Themos Fiatakis. He's global head of FX research at Berkeley. Themos, when you look at the UK, the most interesting bit is, of course, whether we have the fiscal plan, the Halloween budget, as it was dubbed on Monday, because then on Thursday we have a Bank of England decision. If this gets delayed to post BOE, how problematic is it for the governor, Andrew Bailey? I think um, a big part of how the Bank of England has basically described the problem is that you have a very difficult underlying situation uh, and you have an overlay of fiscal policy uh, which can either change the situation for more hikes or just reduce the amount of hikes that they need to do, but still the bias is for higher rates. Um, there was a very uh, seminal speech by Ben Broadbent um, uh, last week that basically described that even in the presence of some fiscal easing, um, you would still need to undershoot uh, what the market is pricing. And, you know, Sunak is probably standing for a little bit less fiscal easing than before. So the overall setup for the Bank of England is, a, you know, a, a setup where they need to hike, but less than what is priced in. Uh, and how far less uh, will depend on the budget. And, you know, I think that there, you know, for the next meeting, they don't have enough information to rely on in terms of that bit. But Themos, I mean, I guess the, the market, and I don't know whether the market is under or overpricing this, right? But the market is, is afraid of what happened about four weeks ago, which is we didn't have the fiscal plan, the BOE does something, they're not aggressive enough, the market crashes. I mean, this time we had a call between the chancellor and the governor. So is it, is it this time differently if two sides speak to each other? Does it really matter to the markets if the fiscal statement is postponed as long as they speak to each other? A little bit, as you allude, a little bit less than before, for sure. And, you know, a big part of the reason is that the broader market assumption is that, um, particularly based on the market knowing Sunak's platform from his uh, tenure as uh, chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, that it's not going to be a fiscally expansionary platform. So at the end of the day, the trade-offs uh, that the Bank of England is facing are a little bit less punitive. They don't have to do as much as they would have to do, let's just say, on the budget that was released in late September. So that part of the detail matters less. But as you said, yep. you know, the key risk still for the market is that they get underwhelmed regardless uh, of, of fiscal. Okay, Tebos, what's your call then on Sterling going forward? I think, I think Sterling probably weakens. Uh, the UK is facing two shocks. You know, obviously you have an external shock to uh, energy prices and notwithstanding the drop in natural gas prices, uh, remains a very difficult uh, shock to the economy, a stagflationary shock. The UK economy is also facing a decline in its labor force uh, as a result of, uh, you know, Brexit uh, conditions. And that seems to be an additional layer of weakness for the pound, an additional problematic zone for uh, the Bank of England. The pound has stabilized because the Bank of England is now priced to hike more. And the Bank of England will likely not hike as much as they are asked to by markets. Uh, and in, in this setup, given that this new government doesn't show a signal that it's going to particularly right. change the labor market situation by more migration, those dilemmas will probably stay. So this rally or relief that we've seen for the pound, probably a little bit temporary.
All right, Themos, thank you so much. Uh, Themos Fiotakis mm -hmm. there, Global Head of FX Research at Barclays. Now, coming up, we'll discuss all the action in the FX markets and the implications also of a surging dollar. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Later today also, you don't want to miss Youssef's exclusive interview with the Saudi finance minister at the FII conference in Riyadh. I know I'll be tuning in for that conversation on geopolitics. This is Bloomberg. We are not seeing asset quality pressures yet. Obviously, it, this will very much depend on the type of uh, slowdown that we face in the next uh, few quarters. But the bank is uh, better prepared than, than, than ever uh, to uh, withstand any asset quality deterioration that we might see. But again, we are not seeing any uh, quality pre asset quality pressures at the moment in any of the markets where we operate. Well, that was Santander's CFO, Jose Garcia Cantera, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg after the Spanish lender beat estimates. Now, in other earnings, Microsoft posted its weakest quarterly revenue growth in five years, thanks in part to a surging U.S. dollar. Now, here to discuss the implications of a strong dollar, Themos Fiotakis, global head of FX research at Barclays. He's still with us. Themos, how much higher can the dollar go? Um, I think that we are probably at the last sort of like legs of dollar strength. Um, it's pretty clear that, you know, a lot of the components of the U.S. economy are starting to show some peak, whether that is wage growth or whether that is inflation growth or whether that is, uh, you know, the housing market, et cetera. At the same time, uh, we had a very bearish view on Asia, uh, given the, we, our view was that zero COVID policy was here to stay. And that would be an additional impetus for the dollar. Now this is a lot more recognized by markets uh, past the, uh, the uh, National Party Congress. And last but not least, you have seen uh, pretty big evidence that, you know, natural gas and energy prices can swing both ways. So a lot of that is in the price. The main risk here is, the main issue here for the dollar is that if you think about the balance of risks, uh, it's still skewed to the upside. And what I'm saying by this is, you know, warm weather can become cold weather next month and natural gas prices can spike. Intervention yeah. is now stabilizing Asian currencies, but that may actually prove to be uh, an entry point for investors in the future if policies remain uh, geared towards yeah. soft growth. And we could see uh, so quite a few more months yeah. where inflation will go. Sorry. Sorry, Thema, so, so what does that mean for, for example, some of the emerging markets that you follow? If you look at some of the denominated in emerging markets, maybe countries that, you know, have upcoming elections that are large, you know who I'm talking about, what does that mean for them going forward and their debt sustainability? I think that you're hitting the nail in the head here. Um, in this environment where, you know, the majority of the dollar move is behind us, but there's still some upside risk for the dollar, et cetera, one needs to understand that now that the world is set up, differently for different different countries. Uh, there are some parts of the emerging universe uh, that will benefit from some evidence of peaking in policy rates in the US. Uh, these are the high carry currencies with good balance sheets, Brazil, Mex. They tend to benefit when rates volatility peaks. Then there are countries that have a very high sensitivity to high rates, financial conditions, et cetera. So, you know, the fact that global rates will stay high is a bad thing for them. This usually touches on countries that have high financing requirements. The Andeans, Chile and Colombia probably stay under pressure. Uh, India and Indonesia probably still uh, on the negative end. And then the tiebreaker of it all, both for G10 and EM, is how much weaker the Chinese currency will go and how big of an influence that will have both in regional currencies, EMs, and the euro. And there's still probably on the balance a little bit more downside there too, um, uh, to complete the picture. 
Great, Themos, thank you. Uh, Themos Fiotakis, our global head of FX research at Barclays. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Europe suddenly has more gas than it can use. Starved of Russian imports, the region has filled storage facilities with LNG cargoes from around the world, combined with an unusually warm weather that's seen gas prices fall back sharply to less than a third of their summer peak. Bloomberg's weather model suggests Europe European temperatures are set to stay milder than usual, and that will be well into November. Now, Australia's headline inflation has surged to a 32-year high in the third quarter, with consumer prices up 7.3 per cent. Well, that was on a year ago. It came that day after the government warned of mounting debt and deficit in the year as ahead. The RBA thinks inflation will peak just under 8 per cent by the end of the year. And Adidas intends to sell existing Yeezy products product designs using its own branding after ending its partnership with the rapper and designer Ye, formerly known as Kanye West. The company expects a 250 million euro hit to earnings after terminating its relationship with the star over a string of controversial social media comments. Rishi Sunak has named an experienced cabinet to lead the UK through what he calls a profound economic crisis. Jeremy Hunt is remaining as a Chancellor of the Exchequer, but Downing Street has not confirmed if he'll stick to delivering a fiscal update on the 31st of October. Suella Braverman is back in his Home Secretary just days after Liz Truss fired her over a national security breach. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Coming up, some of the biggest U.S. stocks in tech tumble in after hours trading following disappointing results from Alphabet and Microsoft. So we'll have plenty more on that next. This is Bloomberg. European aluminium is really suffering from the war uh, and we see that uh, there is a paradox that uh, a number of the producers has been self-sanctioning uh, in terms of uh, the Russian uh, metal while there are others that uh, are buying uh, the Russian metal and are gaining from the war in many ways. So uh, we see that uh, we, we, are, we are now calling for an action to, uh, to, to sanction Russian metal. Well, that was the chief executive of North Hydro speaking earlier to Bloomberg calling for sanctions on Russian metal. Now, U.S. tech stocks tumbled in after hours trading after some of the industry's biggest companies reported disappointing results. Now, Microsoft posted its weakest quarterly sales growth in five years, while Alphabet sales fell short of expectations. Now, Chip Bellwether at Texas Instruments also gave a weaker forecast. Well, joining us now is Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. Matt, great to have you on the program, as always. So, first of all, what were your, were, were your key takeaways? It's it wasn't great. <coughs> no, it wasn't. But no. did it warrant that much of a sell-off in after hours? Well, it's always tricky, isn't it, with where people's expectations are really fixed. I mean, I think there were three things here. One, obviously, there's the currency headwinds, yep. uh, about five percentage yep. points this quarter, a bit stronger than last quarter, but then uh, clearer slowdown in advertising spending yes. hitting Google, uh, but also some signs that PC and cloud demand is also slowing too. I think you know, particularly what um, Microsoft said about um, you know, Q4, um, in terms of slower Azure growth, which is their main cloud yeah. platform. So, Matt, is it really Google? Is it the, the big one because it gives us more of an indication of you know future earnings performance for all tech stocks? Yeah, I, yeah, I think or so. Yeah, yeah to, to a degree because I mean they're clearly one of the bellwethers along with yeah. Meta for the advertising market, and I think clearly if corporates are spending less on advertising, it tells you that they're tightening yeah. tightening their belts generally. So I think that was a kind of really important signal that we are finally starting to see signs of the economic slowdown hitting uh, corporates at large, uh, and beyond that, we'll see that they have a growing cloud business. Yeah. 
they're still growing well, but it's not making money yet. And so I think there's perhaps some frustration there that you know, how big does this thing have to get before it makes <laughs> some money? Uh, yeah, it's generating seven billion dollars, also um, maybe more of a kind of revenue a quarter. It's kind of you know a, bit, a big business, um, and also YouTube uh, was slower. Uh, and I think that points to the structural pressures in the ad market with right. TikTok coming in uh, and really pressuring the established players in that marketplace. So they're all trying to rival TikTok. Um, yeah, uh, rival it and and kind of catch right. up on it, uh, kind of replicate what TikTok's doing to their own businesses. Yeah, uh, that but doesn't yeah, not, really work, right? Unless you um, have the younger crowd. No, it, it doesn't. Yeah, I can think TikTok's got such a strong lead. Obviously, the other area that they're trying to kind of uh, tap into with YouTube is the whole connected TV push, mm -hmm. uh, and I think people are expecting to see some better traction there. But with you know, clients cutting budgets, um, there's less money to go around. Um, t talk to me a little bit about Elon Musk and Twitter. Yeah. So he thinks that by this Friday he's got it and then there was all this rumor about cutting 75% of the workforce. Yeah, that's right. So obviously, first of all, is the deal going to happen by Friday? It's kind of certainly leaning more that way, and the, the kind of the, the bid spread has narrowed. He had a call apparently yesterday with his bankers to line up the debt, so that's really important. Uh, I think yeah, the, the headcount cuts. I mean, I think Alex Webb was was talking about this last week, and when he was in San Fran a month or two ago, definitely the word on the street was that you know Twitter can easily cope with uh, 60 or 70 percent less heads. So uh, I think certainly if Elon does do the deal, he's going to kind of significantly yeah, reimagine what Twitter is as a business. Matt, thanks so much. As always, Matt Blockson there looking at tech from Bloomberg Intelligence. Coming up, earnings season, full swing. In case you hadn't noticed, major European banks reported today. So we'll discuss how things are looking with Mike Scott. He's lead portfolio manager for high yield and credit opportunities at Man Group. This is Bloomberg. Earnings in the spotlight to Deutsche Bank and Unicredit lift their revenue outlooks as higher rates boost trading for Barclays. It's a miss. Big tech battered Microsoft, Alphabet and Texas Instruments tumble after hours as weak earnings hit some of the world's top companies. Plus, the new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak appoints his cabinet as the Times reports he may delay next week's fiscal statement. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So earnings season picking up pace with inflation looming over quarterly results. Let's discuss all of this with Mike Scott. He is lead portfolio manager for high yield and credit opportunities at Man Group. It's, of course, the world's largest publicly traded hedge fund firm. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Now, first of all, when you look at banks in general, so this mm -hmm. is your specialty, right? You do high credit. Um, when you look at the, the sustainability of some of this credit in banks overall, are we in a better place than we were 10 years ago? I would say we're certainly in a better place uh, from a credit perspective. Um, you know, clearly, post um, the GFC, banks tr um, have really gone through a, uh, a cleansing in, in from a improving the balance sheet metrics um, uh, from um, solvency, um, et cetera. So from a credit perspective, we're actually less concerned um, about the banking system going into what we see as a global, global downturn. Um, but nonetheless, we do think that earnings will likely become pressured um, as we go into 23 from okay. rising um, provisions. I mean, three weeks ago, it's pretty scary what happened on the, uh, on the guilt market. Mm -hmm. And we were hearing about some huge margin calls with mm -hmm. some operators also potentially going bust if the Bank of England hadn't intervened. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that was a very interesting uh, um, period. Uh, and I, I don't think it was necessarily um, just solely a UK problem. I think what it does highlight is the, the hidden leverage that exists uh, within the financial system, not least just in the banking system, but also in the shadow banking system. You know, I think we've seen numbers where you know, our total assets in the pension industry in the UK are 500 billion, but actually there's 1.5 trillion of invested assets. And, and clearly from um, uh, these derivative contracts, um, when there was a um, you know, significant margin calls yeah. in the rise in guilt yeah. yields, it's uh, had a a very clear impact and devastating impact in, in um, for, for, for some of these pensions. But Mike, so as we go into QT, I mean, this is a, an extremely uncertain time because mm. you see parts of the markets, part of the, the banking, and we mentioned shadow banking mm. uh, during the break, where people have been swimming naked, right? Which mm. is not the same business if your leverage is 1%, if suddenly interest rates go to 5%. Where do you uh, see the fault lines? Uh, absolutely. So from a credit perspective, so we work in uh, some investment grade and certainly yeah. is always at the bleeding edge, uh, I would say, of a downturn and, and a rising interest rate environment. 
Um, we certainly see defaults picking up. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, what is interesting actually about this cycle is actually from a high yield perspective, high yield bond market perspective, companies are coming into this from actually a position of strength. Uh, they, they have spent the last two years terming out their debt, uh, which has actually meant that default pressures we think could be, well, certainly increased, but certainly won't be um, comparable to what we saw in the GFC. But this is what, 20% of possible defaults, or is that too I high? think that's, that's very high. Uh, I think in a, in, a, in a bearish case, we could see high single digit. I think in our base case, we're likely to see mid single digit. But nonetheless, we are coming from um, uh, very low levels uh, currently. And as we go into you know, a broader global downturn, that is very much going to be a feature of 2023. I mean, how difficult at this point is it to see, you know, the banks that are uh, in more of a prepare, you know, precarious situation than others? Again, I mean, we didn't see any margin calls, for example, on some of the big commodity players or hedge funds that mm. maybe we're expecting at the time of the invasion of Ukraine. Mm. But then you could have a whole other set of problems. Mm. So I think for me, a financial side of things, as I say, from a credit perspective, we do see um, the banking sector in a much better state than it was um, 10 yeah. years ago. Um, so from uh, where we do have concerns, however, in, in credit markets, is very much more in the loan space. Right. Uh, so where um, companies... Mortgages? So, uh, as in um, leverage loans. Okay. Um, so these are a close cousin, I would say, to the high yield bond market. And many of these businesses um, are unhedged from an interest rates perspective. Just to give you a, um, a stats, 30% of businesses uh, in, in the leverage loan market in, in Europe are hedged for interest rate rises. So that's 70% of the market is unhedged. And that was before going into a, 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 um, a more difficult demand backdrop. So we do see default rates being actually more problematic in the loan leverage, leverage loan market than we do in the high yield bond market. And this is what, for the UK? Or is there a difference between UK and Europe? Or, or do they have very similar patterns? They have quite similar patterns insofar as both economies or major economies have felt um, a very strong terms of trade shock. Uh, and that has been driven by you know, the energy crisis. And as you say, the, the, the war, in, war, war in Ukraine has been a big um, driver of that. Um, I would say that from a European UK perspective, um, the market is already pricing in to some degree quite a dire backdrop mm -hmm. for 2023. I think we see actually moving over to the US, that's not the case. Right. So actually the US market yep. is yep. still needs to price in what we expect to be a uh, a recessory type backdrop for the US as well uh, in 2023. So Mike, when you look at your charts and when you look at some of the high yield credit, where do you see the, the, you know, the signals of distress coming? I think they, they, they have been building already. Uh, and um, the, uh, um, the, the initial sectors to, to really um, to show um, uh, credit distress already have yeah. been primarily very affected by interest rate rises. So the property sector, for instance, consumer durables, et cetera. But I think as we look into 2023, this is certainly going to morph into uh, more traditional cyclicals in the way of industrials, um, you know, cap goods, basics, uh, automotive OEMs and, 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 and suppliers. But as I say, I do think that you know, from, from, from our perspective, whilst default rates are going to certainly increase in the high oil bond market, yeah. um, they may not be as, um, we don't expect them to be as severe okay. as they were in, 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 in the prior so recessionary what's your, backdrop. Mike, what's your highest conviction call? So our highest conviction call um, currently, and where we're paid for, 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 for the risk that we take, we think yeah. non-cyclical cash generative businesses okay. with, with very strong pricing power. So we like areas of healthcare, we like areas of consumer staples uh, in particular. Often these businesses have uh, very strong asset backing as well. So from a creditor perspective, we not only get um, you know, fairly resilient cash flows, but we also get security uh, from, from the assets that back, um, back those credits as well. Mike, thank you so much for coming on TV today. Mike thank Scott, you. their lead portfolio manager for high yield and credit opportunities at MAN GLG. Now, coming up, we'll recap what we've heard so far from European bank earnings. We also look at market reaction. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, returning to one of the biggest stories this morning, Deutsche Bank says it may exceed its full year revenue target after beating a third quarter earnings estimate. The chief financial officer, James Lott Molke, spoke to Danny Berger a short time ago about those strong earnings. 
what we're focused on, on is having a portfolio of businesses that can sort of create some earning stability throughout the cycle. And you're seeing that now with very strong FIC and relatively weak or very weak origination advisory. I think that will sort of change again or there'll be a rotation in 2023 as the as volatility begins to stabilize. You know, the markets now I think have a clearer view of terminal rates for interest. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think there'll be a, a settling once, once we have visibility into the path of, of both interest rates and the economy. So is that deal flow then comes back 2020? And I think at that point the deal flow begins to come back. In a sense, micro, macro shifting back to micro at a point in time, at which point origination advisory and, and for example, the credit business mm. within thick markets would likely start to come when, back. When do you see that happening? When in 2023? If, if, you had, if I had to guess, it would be the second half of next year. So I okay. think there's still, still some time to go on, on this more volatile environment. As you say, it's important as well, the, the, the businesses that we have that have large deposit books and who are based on growing loans, so, so corporate bank and mm. private bank, they're now seeing real momentum, benefiting from interest rates, but also client activity. But when it comes to those riskier loans, the leveraged loans, is now the time, until the environment normalizes, to get low to the ground, to cut back on risk? Well, look, our commitment pipeline at this point is down to only about $2 billion, and we've, we think we've marked that now appropriately to the, to the current conditions. It's a feature of the leveraged debt capital markets that, that there'll be a backup every once in a while when financial market conditions change. The banks work through their pipelines, and then as investors and also issuers find sort of a more accommodative environment and more predictability in terms of pricing, the market reopens. And you're, you're beginning to see that already yeah. in the third quarter. Deutsche Bank uh, Chief Financial Officer James von Malka speaking there to our own Danny Berger. Well, Danny's in Frankfurt for us. So, Danny, great interview. Can you walk us through some of the numbers from Deutsche Bank? Yeah, Deutsche Bank's story really is one that reflects the entirety of the banking sector we've seen so far this year. So the volatility means that trading numbers were strong, thick revenue, that was really strong, easily beating most of Wall Street. Uh, interest rates, those also giving them a lift, net interest income was higher as well. But similarly, like the rest of the banking sector, advisory and origination was very weak, perhaps weaker at Deutsche Bank than a lot of other banks. Of course, that business is a bit smaller than we see elsewhere, but that fell 85 percent you heard in that interview there he does think that it will come back in the third quarter or rather by mid next year um, but still is painful and costs are higher so those two combined might be part of the reason we're seeing some of the weakness in shares this morning so the business may still be strong Danny Deutsche Bank also operating in a difficult economy what did he tell you about that mm. yeah he sees a two percent recession in Germany next year but it's not just that it is a permanent shift that Germany is going to have to go through. It is, he called it, a deep restructuring that will last many years. It's changing energy policy. It's changing trade with China. It's changing exports. And then there are also risks. He doesn't see them in the banking system, but he does see them spread out through these financial markets that regulators perhaps have less leverage over. He talked to me about that. Take a listen. The market is uncertain how much of the risks and where has gone into the non bank sector, the less regulated sectors, and, and so is there, is there sort of, there are going to be shoes to drop in, in that area? That's probably the, the, the greatest deal, degree of focus. And then also what we sometimes call cross-asset risk, so, so ways in which asset markets talk to each other that, that models sometimes don't predict, those are two areas that we're, we're looking for and in, in, in looking out for potential, potential risks and surprises. Yep. So, Danny, Deutsche Bank CFO, they're also telling you some advice. I love this so much for Credit Suisse. I'm sure they loved it. Yeah, it, look, it felt right to ask Francine because, of course, it's the biggest story in banking at the moment. But also Deutsche Bank, more than three years ago, had to go through the same process of doing a restructuring, a large one, in order to get that investor confidence back. Von Mocha said it came down to being decisive. Um, to having discipline execution. And so I said, okay, give me exactly, exactly what is your advice to your peer going through something similar? He said, they've gotta be patient, they need to have their eye on literally every detail, and you have to bring your people along. Of course, Francine, that people question, retaining talent, we know that's been a, a, a bit of a stick in the mud for Credit Suisse. Yeah, so difficult as people leave the firm. Thank you so much, our Denny Berger there, great mm -hmm. interview.
with the, the chief financial officer of Deutsche Bank. Now, as we've been hearing a big week for earnings banks, well, bank earnings, Santander Barclays also reporting we also had unit credit. So let's get our resident expert from Bloomberg Intelligence on the banks. He is Jonathan Tice. Uh, Jonathan, great to have you today to really try and unpack like the, the millions, I mean, maybe not millions, but the dozens of banks we're getting yep. this week. Who's strongest? Well, I mean, we've seen very good revenue across the board. I think if you look at share price reactions, for example, yesterday HSBC a little bit harsh, CFO yep. did leave, yep. but a, a, a very strong set of numbers. Look at Santander today, a very comfortable beat on revenue, but a small cost miss. So when you say who's strongest, everybody's getting the uplift from net interest income. One thing is key, you've got to do a really good job on costs, because the market is looking through the net interest income uplift at the moment. They're looking at what management are doing with costs. They're also looking at guidance on bad debt and provisioning. And again, HSBC was a little ahead of consensus there. But are you surprised that we haven't seen a bit, you know, distress in that yet? So you, either loans, but also mortgages, or does that come early next year? It's too early to see it in the numbers, but because of IFRS 9, which is the way they can account for it, we're going to begin to see banks taking charges ahead of time. They, they can do things like management overlays, post-model adjustments. Yeah. This quarter and a lot more next quarter, we're expecting to see banks build the buffers because also you lower your ROE. You don't want the regulators and the Bank of England and, and the ECB looking at revenues and saying, hang on a sec, you guys are making 15% ROE just because rates are going up. Here comes a new windfall tax. So provisioning will be used as well, I think, by the banks to try and stave off measures from regulators. So are, are you expecting a lot more of those provisions to be, I mean, when does it hit? And is actually, is it more UK banks compared to European banks? I think probably more UK at the moment. Um, and I think Lloyds and Barclays today, Lloyds and NatWest will be talking about this. Yeah. Um, the bigger banks, BNP, for example, has a very sensible policy. They kind of smoothed it anyway, so we won't see any negative surprises there. It's the Santander's of this world with the big EM businesses. That's where, if you do get a move, they move very, very quickly. Yeah. What did you make of Barclays? Um, decent numbers. They're doing well on costs. Um, FIC was decent. I think all in all, they're doing a very good job. But uh, as ever with wholesale funded banks, um, the market doesn't really care. And they look through the trading. I mean, FIC, 63% growth in dollars was oh. huge. And they're a dollar beneficiary. You look at HSBC yesterday, the dollar has hurt them quite badly because of their UK cost base. So doing well, but uh, as ever, the market sort of looks through it. So what does the market want to know, like the, the business model longer term, right, which some, sometimes gets muddled in the earnings quarterly results? Yeah, I mean, sustainability, as the uh, CFO of Deutsche said, the question we have is how quickly does FIC stabilize? Equities no. isn't doing great. Um, and no. fees, Deutsche was of the biggest fall, but I mean, they've fallen off a cliff. Remember last year it was massive fees, no. terrible FIC and OK equities. I think FIC will continue to do well through into early next year. How quickly does fees bounce back and how brutal will they be on costs? Because yeah. it is the fee pool from the investment bank that pays the bonuses. Talking about brutal, what do you do with Credit Suisse? Well, it, it will be interesting. I mean, it's all about how many disposals they make. Because if they don't manage to sell enough at the right price, they do need a capital raise. Clearly, that's dilutive. They don't want the regulator to step in and say, you need a capital yeah. raise. So it's about the disposals for them. I mean, is there really talk, and I hear this, and I kind of, you know, a lot of times push back, it's not a solvency problem. Is, I mean, is it a problem? We're not talking about this bank going under. No, no, no. But remember, though, that what we learned in 2009, it's not about capital, it's about liquidity. And as and when clients stop into bank market closes, we start worrying about these things. So no, it isn't solvency, but they do need to shore up capital. Jonathan, thank you so much. As always, Jonathan Tice there on the banks from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, we'll take a look at what is driving the markets today. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Garrens. Hi, Leanne.
Mm -hmm. Zara, parent company Inditex, has agreed to sell its business in Russia to the Middle Eastern Deher Group. The deal will preserve a substantial number of jobs in Russia, with the company picking up most of the store rental contracts. In June, Inditex, the world's biggest clothing retailer, said it was taking a 260 million euro provision for shutting operations in Russia and in Ukraine. General Motors beat Wall Street's consensus third quarter profit estimates on record revenue, adjusted profit of $2.25 a share, surpassing analyst projection of $1.89. GM also maintained its full year profit thanks to strong sales of its luxury Cadillac SUVs and largest trucks. We're seeing still very strong demand for our products. We're seeing uh, strong uh, av uh, average transaction pricing uh, that we, we continue to uh, be able to build on. And so, you know, we are starting to see inventory build just a little bit, but well below levels that were in the past. So overall, we're still seeing a very strong consumer for our products. And Adidas intends to sell existing Yeezy product designs using its own branding after ending its partnership with the rapper and designer Ye, formerly known as Kanye West. The company expects a 250 million euro hit to earnings after terminating its relationship with the star over a string of controversial social media comments. Intel's self-driving technology company Mobileye has raised $861 million in one of the biggest U.S. IPOs of the year. Shares priced above the marketed range at the IPO price, the company has a market value of more than $16 billion. Intel will still control mobile eye. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now let's get more on what's moving markets in the second hour of equity trading with Bloomberg's Joe Easton. Joe, thank you for joining us. We look at the banks, we look at technology. Yeah, so obviously a big earnings day, as you mentioned, you know, the banks taking a lot of focus. Um, obviously some individual stories going on there with Deutsche Bank and um, Santander as well. But they're all really um, facing the same um, kind of dynamics at the moment. Higher central bank rates is by far the most important thing for any bank um, at the moment. It's really a big kind of payday for them. But obviously the downside is the potential for a slowdown in loans, um, particularly in the UK with the mortgage market crisis, um, consumer credit cards, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a strange situation where banks are getting a big boost at the moment from the rising rates, yep. but are also very wary that they could see yeah. a drop down in their loans coming through. Um, Joe, what do we do with technology? So it wasn't great. No, it's, uh, I think it's looking pretty scary, actually, some of the numbers um, that you're seeing, some of the declines that we've seen in, you know, Google, Microsoft, um, pre-market, not looking great at all. Kind of makes sense, given that they're so entrenched in the global economy yep. and have so many um, suppliers and other businesses that are dependent on them. Yep. But then you have to think how much further can these stocks go? And if the economy starts to, you know, bottom out, um, into early next year. Central banks then have to rethink the policy outlook and you'd potentially see a lowering of the discount rates and those stocks could look yeah. cheap again. So I think there's a, obviously a lot going on. And then Joe, tomorrow, ECB. So this is a big one. And then we had actually the new Italian Prime Minister going after the ECB in her first speech yesterday. Yep, so ECB tomorrow, obviously most people looking for a 75 basis point hike, but I think there's a lot of um, dive division um, in the central bank there. You mentioned Italy. You know, if you're Italy, do you really want to start hiking rates really um, aggressively at the moment. I don't think so. The same with Spain. Germany, yes. Um, so there's some division. And with the euro, the, the cheap level where the euro is, that will start importing inflation more into the eurozone yeah. as um, the, the end of the year comes in. And I think that could even put more pressure on some of the more hawkish members to hike. But the other prefer periphery members will be less keen to do so. OK, you have stocks to watch. Or you were looking at the stocks and we're cleaning our houses less. Yep, that's coming from uh, Reckitt in uh, the UK. So Reckitt obviously make Lysol, a couple of other big brands, but yep. they say that the hygiene business is dropping. Sales aren't as good as expected. We're all not cle cleaning as much as we were during the pandemic. We didn't have much else to do. We were all cleaning, and now we're not doing so much of that. <laughs> oh, come on, Joe. People, clean your houses. This is like our, our word of advice for Wednesday, right? I mean, I should start cleaning my well, house more. Yeah, Reckitt will want you to do so. Yeah, so guilty as charged. Ourselves. Joe, thank you so much. Joe Easton there with the stocks to watch as well. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Pretty good deck. Kaylee Lyons in New York or Anna Edwards here in London. And this is Bloomberg.
the risk of a U.S. recession is uncomfortably high. I don't like it where it is. I don't think it's a done deal. I don't think it's 100%. On the persistence, the high level and persistence of inflation, the rate environment, and now with a recession call both in the U.S. and Europe, the recession we believe will be in, in and around 2% next year in GDP terms relative to 22. We're prepared to a more extreme scenario, which would see a recession on average at more than 3% next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Tech's big day turns into a bust. Microsoft, Alphabet, and Texas Instruments all come out with disappointing results. Deutsche Bank delivers fixed income trading revenue soars while rising interest rates boost income from lending. And it's Rishi Sunak's first full day in office. Will his government stick to the date for the next week for next week's fiscal statement? A cabinet official suggests it could be delayed. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lyons and Kriti Gupta in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Kaylee, it seems we're all suffering a little bit of a tech hangover, certainly if you look at European markets and US futures. But before that, we still had some positivity in Asia. Yeah, Asia didn't really feel that downward drag from the disappointing U.S. tech earnings of after the bell yesterday. In fact, we saw a continued recovery from what was brutal selling on Monday. Of course, that recovery started in the Tuesday session and it continued on this Wednesday. Overall, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index higher by about 1.3 percent on the day with Chinese stocks up about eight tenths of one percent. One thing boosting sentiment is a vow from the PBOC and China's foreign exchange authority saying that they will support the development of stock and bond markets and the Chinese yuan will remain, quote, relatively stable. And on the subject of the yuan, the offshore yuan strengthening against the U.S. dollar coming off of record lows, actually stronger by 1.75 percent on the day. So really big move. We're now back down at the 718.58 level or so. So definitely something to watch, although keep in mind that literally everything in Asia and G10 is weaker or stronger rather against a weaker U.S. dollar on the day. And of course, in the bond market, we have seen some real uh, buying coming in yields moving sharply lower, a move that started with the Treasury market yesterday, but that continued overnight in Australia. For example, the 10 year yield down nearly 16 basis points on the day to just shy of 392 Creedy. Yeah, Kaylee, that tech hangover that maybe escaped Asia definitely has not escaped the United States. What I will say, though, is some of the gains or some of the losses that you did see earlier in the session, well, some of those have been paired. Check it out. The S&P 500 futures only down five-tenths of one percent. Earlier in the session, you did actually see them lower by almost one percent. So perhaps a little bit of readjustment post those tech earnings. Take a look at the 10-year yield, though, because as you pointed out, the bond market is catching a bit around the world, it seems. 404 on the 10-year yield, down about six basis points, but in a volatility kind of in context and still actually still not as big of this move that we've been seeing. Remember moves of 15, 20 basis points in one day. Do we see that again today? Uh, perhaps as maybe a little bit panic on the macro sphere. Speaking of as we see those yields come lower, the dollar follows not too far behind down about nine tenths of one percent. What's interesting though is that even with the weaker dollar, you're not seeing a massive move higher in commodities. In fact, Brent crude only up about two tenths of one percent trading with a 93 handle. Anna, whether that continues remains to be seen. Mm. Yeah, we've seen quite a bit of volatility actually in that oil price just this morning, Chrissy. Let's have a look at the European picture and it looks pretty mixed actually and we're caught between a, a number of different narratives here. We've got the positivity perhaps coming from a lower uh, at the margin, very recent uh, lower yield environment. That seems to be the, the most recent developing story attached to weaker data out of the US. That might leave room for risk assets to rally. But on the other hand, the tech story is not positive and we've got a mixed picture for earnings here in Europe as well with recession fears on the horizon. So all of that playing into a mixed story for Europe. Here's a few of the, uh, the businesses reporting today that I picked out to talk about. Santander, the Spanish bank, down by 3.4%. On the map, you could see that Spain was weak, and partly it's to do with Santander. They actually delivered numbers that showed that, just like many of the other banks in Europe, they're in a bit of a sweet spot where the net interest margin is getting a boost from the higher rates environment, and we haven't really seen too many questions about asset quality deterioration just yet, although there's a fear that's coming. Costs a bit of an issue at Santander, according to some of the analysts. Unicredit, this stock uh, up by 4%, showing some of the same dynamics I described 
describe uh, in terms of the banking sector and net interest margins uh, and also uh, pleasing the market it would seem with some of the guidance that they've uh, renewed and improved for another quarter. Heineken is down by 10% today. This is a beer maker of course and their trading volumes, their volumes, the amount of beer they sold actually went up uh, but not as much as had been anticipated and costs once again an issue over at Heineken. Uh, here's the pound and here we are seeing a little bit of response to what's going on in fixed income and a reassessment perhaps or a re-evaluation of just how much hiking we get from the Federal Reserve and other central banks. So the pound at 116 right now up by more than 1%. So real recovery we're seeing here in the pound. But it is a dollar weakness story and it is because at the margin investors Kaylee increasingly questioning just how much hiking and for how long we're going to get from the Federal Reserve as we see that data in the U.S. deteriorate. Yep, which is why the dollar is so much weaker on the day and we are seeing a bid coming into the bond market. We will keep on top of those cross asset moves. But first, we want to zero in on tech stocks, which, as we said, are dragging on risk sentiment this morning. In pre-market trading, you have Microsoft and Alphabet each down in the ballpark of 6% after disappointing results for Microsoft. It posted its weakest quarterly sales growth in five years. Alphabet sales fell short of expectations as well. Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take is joining us now for more. So, Alex, sentiment wasn't overly bullish going into these results and yet somehow the bar was still too high what does this tell us well yes as you say quite rightly i think the bar was quite low and anything that suggested even the slightest glimmer of upside was likely to have been taken well there was very little upside uh, it probably oughtn't have been a surprise we we knew that in a lot of the spending when it came to cloud computing when it came to hardware had been bought brought forward by the the lockdowns as you know companies worked out how their employees were going to work from home but we also saw then that uh, the impact of inflation on consumer spending has therefore affected companies ability to, to advertise and so that has a massively detrimental effect on Google which is you know the single biggest advertising technology company in the world we'd seen an impact on the smaller guys the fact that it is now hitting Google as well is significant but then we also have it hitting the business investment side as well with Microsoft. Talk to us a little bit about the impact or at least the read through in some of those Asia numbers. Yeah, so like Azure is, uh, we should qualify this by saying that it's the outlook for Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud computing business that has really roiled the market a little bit with obviously Microsoft now appearing to trade down. But the commentary was that growth will be 5% slower than in the, in the previous quarter. So if you read through those numbers, it still implies 37% growth compared to the 42%. So it is still a growing business. It's just clearly not as fast as it used to be. And as I was saying before, it is likely because people front load a lot of their spending, their onboarding onto that platform um, during the lockdowns. There isn't that much more new spending um, as a consequence. Alex, finally, we see a ripple effect from Alphabet's results in the week advertising trends there through other ad sensitive stocks like Meta, for example. It's not touching Twitter, though. Twitter is actually higher by about four tenths of one percent, fifty three dollars a share. That has everything to do with Elon Musk saying he plans to close the deal by Friday. What's the likelihood that really happens? Well, it's a, a lot of the reporting that our colleagues have made suggests that bankers are working very hard to do, do so. The only um, obvious fly in the ointment would appear to be some regulatory pushback. It seems as though that maybe the Biden administration is having a look at the deal in the context of, of um, the, some of the comments that Elon Musk has made at, pertaining to the war in Ukraine. Uh, but we haven't yet had anything official of, on that nature. So um, as things stand, as implied by the stock price, there is a lot of confidence in this deal happening by the end of the week. Again, I will qualify that by saying the stock has never traded a, <laughs> um, in line with the $54.20. So there's mm -hmm. always a little bit of wiggle room. A little bit of execution risk still in that price then. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take with the latest on the news flow coming through thick and fast from the tech sector. More on that later. It's also a busy week for European bank earnings. Deutsche Bank says it may exceed its full year revenue target after beating third, qu uh, th third quarter earnings estimates. But the CFO, James Van Molke, is still looking for potential risks in the current macro backdrop. He spoke with Bloomberg's Danny Berger earlier. The market is uncertain how much of the risks and where has gone into the non-bank sector, the less regulated sectors. And, and so is there, is there sort of, are there going to be shoes to drop in, in that area? That's probably the, the, the greatest degree of focus. And then also what we sometimes call cross-asset risk. So, so ways in which asset markets talk to each other that, that models sometimes don't predict. 
those are two areas that we're, we're looking for and, and, and looking out for potential, potential risks and surprises. Yep. James Ramolka there. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now from Frankfurt with more. Danny, trading comes in strong. Deals, though, are, are bad and bad across the sector. Where does Deutsche Bank go from here? Well, Deutsche Bank von Molka specifically, when I asked him about that business mix, he did think it would normalize. He said, look, deal flow, deal activity, for us, that's going to come back. For the markets, it's going to come back by the second half of next year, once interest rates normalize, or at least we get a grip on that environment. But in the meantime, this was their worst quarter for deals and origination since the financial crisis, dropping 85 percent year over year. Now, to be clear, FIC was really strong. Net interest income gave them a boost as well, thanks to higher rates. So overall, their earnings net revenue looks strong. But yes, that, that is definitely a problem for them. And also a problem was higher than expected earning uh, costs, rather. Um, obviously, higher earnings is not a problem. But higher than expected costs was a problem. And that's potentially why we see shares lower today. On the subject of problems, other banks have their fair share of them, including Credit Suisse. And James von Molka also had some advice to Credit Suisse for their restructuring. <laughs> what was his message? Yeah, Kaylee, you, you know I had to ask this. Because, look, at the end of the day, Deutsche Bank went through the same th thing. More than three years ago, they started their uh, mass restructuring, trying to get investor confidence back, and by most measures, if not all, they have. So he said, look, the key to that success, it's about being very decisive, taking action, sticking to it. Um, and then I said, OK, then what's your advice to Credit Suisse specifically? And he said for them that they need to be patient, very, very focused on literally every detail, and they need to bring their people along. Of course, we know talent retainment at Credit Suisse, that certainly has been an issue for them. Danny, thanks so much. Bloomberg set Danny Berger from Frankfurt with the latest on the Deutsche Bank story. Uh, let's get to UK politics. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak named an experienced cabinet to lead the UK through what he called a profound economic crisis. He confirmed that Jeremy Hunt will remain Chancellor of the Exchequer, but according to Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, Sunak may delay an economic plan scheduled for next week and watched closely by the markets. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joins us now from Westminster. Lizzie, uh, what do we know then about the October 31st uh, a date that we have marked in our diaries, marked in our calendars, as important for a fiscal statement in the UK. Well, Rishi Sunak's been meeting his new cabinet for the first time this morning, including the, new, the returned Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. So we'll be expecting confirmation later today. James Cleverly, of course, the Foreign Secretary, hinting at a delay. And, of course, it wouldn't be surprising if Rishi Sunak wanted to delay this because it's going to be a premiership-defining fiscal statement. Jeremy Hunt has said himself he's going to have to take eye-wateringly difficult decisions, although Hunt has hinted that he, he personally wouldn't want to delay the fiscal statement so that the Bank of England can take account of it and so that potentially there could be a smaller rate hike from the Bank of England this time. The good news, though, is that former BOE and OBR official Charlie Bean has said that the fiscal black hole that uh, Jeremy Hunt's going to have to shrink is now smaller. It's now £30 billion rather than £40 billion by his estimation because of Rishi Sunak's effect on calming the markets. Well, Rishi Sunak has also appeared to have kept his friends fairly close, his enemies even closer when it comes to his cabinet appointments. What does that say about his administration? Well, it's been a firm nod to party unity. He's kept the three holders of the great offices of state in the same positions they were last week. Uh, a bit of a uh, change in the middle for Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, but she is the most controversial reappointment uh, because she was sacked only six days ago for breaching the ministerial code. Yesterday, Rishi Sunak was professing to be bringing back integrity to Number 10, uh, and yet Braverman is back and it seems to have been because of the deals Sunak had to make with the Tory right to get into number 10. So you can expect Keir Starmer, the opposition leader, to raise that point at Prime Minister's questions in his first face-off uh, as Prime Minister uh, with, with uh, Rishi Sunak later. Uh, but it's also meant that Sunak's key allies have had to have rewards lower down the pecking order. So, for example, Mel Stride, his chief campaign officer, uh, becomes work and pension 
Foreign Secretary, although that is an important role at this moment, uh, given the debate over whether benefits should rise in, rise in line with inflation. He thinks they should. Uh, but it also means that Penny Mordaunt hasn't had a promotion. She didn't look very happy coming out of number 10 yesterday. Uh, but perhaps that's her punishment for only conceding to Rishi Sunak at the very last minute. But really, the, the need for party unity uh, has meant that Rishi Sunak, as you say, has had to keep his enemies closer than perhaps he'd have liked to. All right, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, thank you so much for your terrific reporting from Westminster. Let's get back to some of the earning stories we need to pay attention to this morning, though, and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. One of the disappointing tech results out after the bell yesterday, in addition to the big guys, Microsoft and Alphabet, was Texas Instrument. This company makes chips for everything from home appliances to missiles, and its quarterly forecast came up short of expectations. So that suggests that the chip slump is expanding beyond just smartphones and computing. As a result, that stock is down about 4.6% before the bell. It is also a downward move for Spotify after its results. It said profit margins may narrow because of higher programming costs, and as a result, it may need to raise prices here in the U.S. Interestingly, the company also talked about a slowdown in ad spending, so that echoes what we heard from Google overnight as well. Spotify down about 4.9%, and it's an even bigger plunge for Skechers, the shoemaking company uh, that sells a bunch of sneakers. It missed expectations for its forecast on both the top and bottom line. And as a result, that stock is down 13 and a half percent before the bell, Anna. OK, coming up on the program, then, Kaylee, we will be uh, in Riyadh. The Future Investment Institute event is taking place in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. An exclusive conversation will bring that to you with Saudi Arabia's Minister of Finance. Plus, the world's biggest source of clean energy is evaporating fast. Read more of today's Big Take story all about hydropower's climate nightmare on Bloomberg.com or on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's early edition. I'm Kriti Gupta alongside Anna Edwards and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. I really want to dive in here with a terminal chart that really caught my eye about housing prices. This is enormous because this actually moved the market yesterday through the bond market, ripple effect into the stock market. For our radio audience, stick with me. Basically, we're looking at S&P, CoreLogic, Case-Shiller data from 20 cities. The housing prices around some of these major countries actually dropping quite a bit, the most, by the way, since 2009. At the same time, you see mortgage rates really, really rising quite quickly. The effect of the Federal Reserve and those massive hikes perhaps now actually having a more tangible effect on housing market that's considered to be extremely, extremely tight, perhaps booming a little too fast. That slack in the housing market perhaps helping the case for a little bit of a Fed pivot. Once again, yesterday it fed into the bond market, which then in turn fed into the stock market. I want to bring in Ksenia Galuchko, the Bloomberg Equities team leader, to hop in on this conversation because Ksenia, to me, this feels like an early sign that perhaps equities do have a reason to rally if they see perhaps a less hawkish stance from the Federal Reserve. Do you agree? That's right, yes. So housing prices are starting to finally calm down and also consumer confidence is plunging in the U.S. And this is good news for inflation and the Fed said a fight to lower it, obviously. So yes, perhaps the stock market can start pricing in a potential pivot, but I think the Fed's comments so far have been very hawkish. We are uh, reiterating that they're going to uh, keep raising rates. They're going to stay hawkish for a while until they really see inflation peaking and starting to fall. And it might still take a couple of months or even a couple of quarters. And Kizenia, that's really interesting then, isn't it? Because this potentially opens up a really big question and a really big opportunity and the market's been wrong-footed by the thought of pivoting before and it's very mindful of that. Where do we see the bottom as now for stocks? Because I know Goldman Sachs thinks we're not there yet. Well, yes, so it depends on who you listen to. So Goldman Sachs indeed says that the U.S. stock market, despite the plunge that we've seen this year, has not priced in recession risks and a possible escalation in the Ukraine war or other geopolitical fears. But it seems like it's their worst case scenario. So they do say that there's potentially 20 or 30 percent downside for the S&P 500 if the U.S. recession does come through. But at the same time, we've got Morgan Stanley's Michael Wilson saying that actually he forecasts a 15 percent bounce for the S&P 500 because 
because it has bounced off that very important technical level of the 200-week moving average. So it could see, we could see upside from here. Mm, okay. It, yeah. Is it still a bear market bounce or is it something more material? Kazenia, thank you very much. European stocks very much in limbo today. Kazenia Galuchko joining us there with the latest on the markets. And for more insight and analysis into the markets, M Live Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. That's where you'll find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Kurti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. President Biden congratulated new British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in a phone call yesterday. The two discussed the Russian invasion of Ukraine and challenges arising from China. The two also talked about the unresolved issue of the Irish border after Brexit. Last month's pickup in Chinese business activity wasn't enough to change the country's grim economic picture. The economy slowed in October as car and re real estate sales weakened. Meanwhile, China's global trade and small business confidence contracted. All this according to Bloomberg's aggregate index of eight early indicators. The European Union's executive arm will lay out plans to drastically cut pollution levels across the block today. That could potentially eliminate more than 70 percent of the 300,000 premature deaths annually over the next decade. Overhauling air pollution will bring the EU closer to guidelines laid out by the World Health Organization. And New York is still the most expensive rental market in the U.S., but Boston has now passed San Francisco for second place on the list. According to rental company listing company Zumper, the median one-bedroom rent in New York is now $3,860. Boston rose almost 6% this month to $3,060, while San Francisco is $40 less. Coming up, we will go live to the Future Investment Institute event in Riyadh with an exclusive conversation with the Saudi Arabia Minister of Finance. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Tech's big day turns into a bust. Microsoft, Alphabet and Texas Instruments all come out with disappointing results. Deutsche Bank delivers fixed income trading revenue soars while rising interest rates boost income from lending. And it's Rishi Sunak's first full day in office. Will his government stick to the date for next week's fiscal statement? A cabinet official suggests it could be delayed. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and uh, Kaylee Lines in New York. In fact, not Matt Miller. Apologies. Chrissy Gibson with us. Matt is off uh, today. Uh, and Chrissy, what do you see in the US futures picture? Because tech has dominated overnight, a sell off in all things big tech as a result of some disappointing sales numbers. Yeah, exactly. No worries, Anna. The resemblance is uncanny uh, with me and, <laughs> me and Matt Miller. But to your point on futures, like that's really. In the room. I, uh, absolutely. He's still here in spirit. The truth about futures, though, is exactly what you said. You do have this macroeconomic fear that what Alphabet and what Microsoft is actually kind of indicating is the slowdown in a recession, essentially what the market is perhaps pricing in for about a year now. But also put this into some perspective from a technical level. You have had two days of gains that have been pretty fast and furious on the S&P 500. Some idea here that perhaps is the start of some sort of sustainable bull market rally, at least for those who are long on the equity market. Today, not so much. So a little bit of a pullback. Even in just the last 30 minutes, you've seen futures go from negative uh, about five tenths of one percent now lower by about eight tenths of one percent and it's not alone the bond market also catching a bid here because you are seeing 10-year yield drop as well about four basis points 406 on the 10-year yield and with those yields lower the dollar follows the Bloomberg dollar index down about six tenths of one percent but even as you see a weakening dollar not all of it is translating into the commodity space remember there is that inverse correlation given a lot of the commodity contracts are priced in dollars nevertheless Brent crude hovering at about a 93 handle Kaylee all right Kurti, well let's take a look at some of those moves that are really creating the drag in the broader equity market and that comes from the mega cap tech companies that gave disappointing results last night as Anna mentioned one of them being Microsoft reporting its slowest sales growth in five years plus its forecast coming up short of expectations it's being hit by the stronger dollar although maybe that's not the case today as well as slumping PC demand so it is down about 
5.9% right now, while Alphabet is down more than 6%. Of course, it's advertising business as it relates to Google as well as YouTube being hit by a slowdown in ad spending with the softening macroeconomic environment. When a giant like Google gets hit, that's how you know it's really bad out there. And that is translating into other advertising reliant companies as well. Meta will be reporting after the bell today. Ahead of those results, it's down about 4% in sympathy with Alphabet. What's interesting is that Twitter also is one of those ad sensitive businesses. It is expected to report this morning, but the fundamentals don't really matter for that company because come Friday, Elon Musk says he will have closed his deal and taken the company private. And so that is why Twitter is higher by about half of 1% this morning. 5303 is where we trade at the moment. So still not quite at that 5420 deal price, but Anna, clearly the market is raising its expectations that that is ultimately yeah. going to go through. Yeah, you just have to watch the uh, Elon Musk Twitter feed, I suppose, to get yeah. the, the news that matters when it comes to uh, Twitter's stock right now. Uh, Kaylee, this is what we see for European stocks. Uh, the stock's 600 here in Europe, down by two-tenths of 1%. We do see some of the tech stocks under pressure as a result of that uh, negativity around US tech. Here's where we're focused, though. The banking sector very much in focus today here for Europe. Santander, the Spanish bank, weighing on the overall Spanish market. This stock down by more than 3% this morning. I spoke to the CFO earlier. He was talking quite positively, actually, about the UK housing market that's a big area of business for Santander right now but in terms of the overall uh, company there are concerns around costs and so uh, that seemed to dominate thinking according to analysts despite the fact that obviously net interest margins have been rising for many of these European banks that's been the focus for Unicredit and the market giving it the benefit of the doubt there 3.6 percent higher for that stock there is that dynamic around net interest margins uh, which is of course important and the company has guided higher for the period ahead so that also matters Heineken is down by 10 and percent the drinks maker there uh, giving a, an update to the market, which showed that, yes, volumes were rising, but not as much as had been expected by analysts. And costs, once again, costs were an issue in the banking sector, costs an issue if you're making beer, it seems, no matter which sector, costs very much in focus. Now, it is the second day of Saudi Arabia's Future Investments Initiative, which is taking place in Riyadh. The conference convenes business, finance and political leaders. Uh, joining us now from the event is Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal El Din, who is joined by a guest. Yusuf. Hey, Anna. Well, I mean, we've said before that there's a huge turnout at this event. There are probably about 5,000 people this year. We found refuge from the crowds, being able to sit down with the Minister of Finance, Mohammed al Jadan. Thank you for making some time for what is a very hectic schedule. Saudi Arabia is the fastest growing G20 economy at the moment. There's a lot going for Saudi Arabia. The rest of the world looks pretty bleak. What can you do to mitigate the impact of a potential recession? in those other parts of the world. Well, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, it is indeed in you know, interesting times. I think the world is facing a lot of challenges, but the world also needs predictability. The world needs stability. And the world needs cooperation. And I can tell you, in Saudi Arabia, we have been planning for years, executing with really dynamic execution program. And we are seeing the results. Uh, the results are very positive, unemployment uh, you know, the lowest in 20 years, private sector is really booming, investment is up, I think, about 16% compared to last year. Consumption is very strong. What you need is a plan, focus and execution, and then you need to deal with prices. You need to make sure that you mitigate early, you are ahead of the curve, you take steps, as we have done over the last couple of years, to ensure that we are protected from these shocks. In terms of 2023, the IMF thinks you can pull in, what, 3.6% in terms of GDP growth. I'm wondering whether that matches up with your thinking at the moment from what you're seeing in the data. I think what we focus on is not the total GDP. In Saudi Arabia, we have the, the oil GDP and non-oil GDP. Vision 2030 focuses on non-oil GDP, and non-oil GDP this year is growing at 5.9. 5 we believe that next year and the next few years are going to grow with similar number, 5 and north of 5%. What about interest rates? Those are going up. Liquidity is being drained from different parts of the world. I look at the Cybor, which is a Saudi inner bank rate. Those are at record highs okay. for the six month. The spread to LIBOR has gone wider as well. What are you doing to alleviate, what are you doing to alleviate some of the liquidity crunch in the system? I think there is a lot of liquidity coming into the system. There is a lot of liquidity coming from the government. There is a lot of liquidity coming from investment. And obviously we have a very strong central bank that is able to 
deal with liquidity. I don't think we have really an issue. We have a very strong banking system, and we are providing a lot of support to the private sector. Part of Vision 2030 is to enable the private sector, and we wanted to see the private sector grow. We are seeing that in investment. Look at the market. The market is up when a lot of markets around the world are down here to date. Saudi market is up. So there is a lot of things going on for Saudi and for the, the Saudi economy, and we will continue to support the private sector growth. Inflation has been under control. I mean, that's a good thing so far. But at the same time, it could go up a little bit in the new year in 2023. What measures are you looking at to take out some of the heat and cost pressures for consumers? Are you looking at maybe revisiting BAT? What we have done, I mean, looking just in the past 18, 24 months, we have done a lot of steps to anticipate this. And we've been, actually, we saw what is happening now almost a year before. And we decided to put a ceiling to the energy prices locally so that the economy is not impacted by increase in the uh, energy prices. We have provided support to low-income uh, households. And we really, really done a great job in making sure that we have a contingency plan when it comes to uh, food. So we stocked more, we built more uh, strategic reserves. We are continuing to do the same. As long as you are ahead of the curve and plan well and execute really dynamically, you will get the results that we are getting. The uh, inflation is below 3%. We don't think it will go even higher than that next year. One of the things that are, that's being talked about a lot, I mean, from what I've been seeing here, is U.S.-Saudi tensions. Now we are waiting for a, what the U.S. considers a retaliatory move because what they're seeing is that the Saudis have taken an aggressive step forward with the decision. You know, of course, you can take the other side of that argument, but for the U.S., it's retaliatory. What would you do if a NOPEC bill got passed, or is that something you're not even considering at this point? Let me tell you, I think without speculating what, what the U.S. is going to do, the U.S.-Saudi relationship has been very strong for the last seven, eight decades. And we weathered a lot of circumstances and situations in the past that are very difficult. I think there are a lot of strategic uh, you know, partnerships and relationships and interests between the two countries. Uh, we are taking steps to make sure that we stabilize the energy market and we'll continue to do so. I mean, we have been tested uh, for years and decades and, and when it comes to energy markets. But we are also focusing in our non-oil uh, sectors. And we wanted to make sure that these are predictable, provide stability, create jobs, investment opportunities. And you are seeing it here in this event. FII is, is the most successful year so far. Investors are believing in the country. They see the results. Uh, and we'll continue to push on. Uh, I will not really be distracted by the noise. Closing question on Saudi Aramco, you're on the board of the company, they're pulling in record profits. Uh, is there any visibility on an increase of dividends? I mean, that is for Aramco board, and Aramco also has a lot of plans to invest. They are investing in their um, uh, uh, capacity, they are investing in distribution lines, they are in investing in gas, they are investing in those stream. I will not speculate what the board is going to decide in terms of dividends, but you know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, we'll have to, uh, to wait and see what will happen early next year. Minister, it's always a pleasure. We've been doing this for a very long time together. I think uh, probably close to 10 years. Uh, so thank you for thank making time you. again. That's the Minister of Finance, Mohammed al -Jadain. Anna, back to you. Yusuf, thanks very much. Bring back Yusuf Gamal al Din and Mohammed al Jadan there, the Saudi Arabian finance minister. Really interesting conversation about US Saudi relationships, crucial as they are in the oil sector. We continue to watch that carefully. Coming up on this program, we'll get back to the tech sector. A big tech takes a big hit. The likes of Google, Microsoft, and Texas Instruments falling in pre market trading after posting disappointing earnings. More on that sector next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Equity Group Investments founder Sam Zell. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Kriti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. Well, U.S. tech stocks are down this morning and taking the broader market down with them after disappointing earnings from some big names. Microsoft posted its weakest quarterly revenue growth in five years, while Alphabet's revenue fell short of expectations. Each of those stocks down around 6% in pre-market trading, while Meta and Twitter are on deck to report today. Joining us now for more is Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Matt, let's just start with Alphabet. If Google can't hang in there, what does that mean for everybody else in this environment? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a kind of fairly uh, significant warning about, you know, the, the direction of travel for uh, advertising budgets across big corporates. Uh, I think we've seen some similar surveys recently, too, pointing to slower spend next year. Um, you know, there are some definitely some nuances there. And also, you've got some of the advertising agencies report today to WPP. And I think, you know, the, the likes of Google are definitely suffering from the downturn in, for example, crypto advertising spend. Uh, but, you know, I think, think definitely across the board pressure on ad budgets. Mm. So that's the alphabet story, and you're, you're, you're sort of broadening it to, to the, ad, uh, the ad story more widely. And I know that we've seen that in different advertising agencies uh, around the world. So that was uh, alphabet. What about Microsoft? We also heard from them overnight. Yeah, Microsoft, actually, their numbers for the quarter were, were pretty strong, slightly better than expectations. It was more of what they said about the, the forward guidance, which was the problem. So Azure, which is their cloud uh, computing business, they were talking about a about a five percentage point slowdown sequentially in growth. Still very strong growth, probably kind of mid thirty percent year on year growth. But you know, I think some some sense there that um, the investment in technology upgrades is starting to slow, and some of that revenue is usage based, and that as corporates see lower activity from their customers, that will translate into lower spending with Microsoft on cloud. So still good growth, but just not as good as people were hoping for. Okay, so still a focus on cloud and. What do we know about the strength of the dollar and how that's impacting these businesses then, Matt? Because this was something we talked about last earnings season mm -hmm. and, it, and it hasn't got much better. No, in fact, it's got a bit worse. So I think um, it was about 5 percentage points of growth headwind uh, for both Microsoft and Google this quarter. And it was about 3 percentage points last quarter. So I think obviously until we lap the, those pressures next year, it's going to be a problem. Unless, of course, the US dollar strength reverses, which seems unlikely uh, for now. So, yeah, it's definitely a, a problem for those US. Uh, listed companies. Well, Matt, what is the next leg of growth then? And when we're talking about cloud, which has really become this fast and furious transition, not just for Microsoft, but for uh, Alphabet as well in their cloud business, and I dare an event say even, even Amazon Web Services, if you start to see this pullback in business investment, what's the next leg of growth for a lot of these big tech companies? Well, it's a good question, and I think that the next leg of growth is essentially competing more directly with each other. Also, we've seen Apple push more aggressively uh, into advertising. Amazon's doing the same thing. So I think it's more each other looking at uh, their respective dominant businesses and trying to push for uh, a share of that pie. How much can be blamed on Apple, Matt? It's definitely a significant factor. I think it's been more of a factor for Facebook and Meta, and obviously they report later today. They've brought the brunt of those changes to ad tracking. Um, a little bit of a, an impact there for, for Google, but I think you know certainly for Google overnight, uh, it's more about the kind of broader economic slowdown and perhaps some of the structural pressures we're seeing from TikTok uh, coming in as a, as, a, as a quick grower in the, the digital ad space. And Matt, finally, in the ad space, Twitter would have some sensitivity there as well, but that doesn't really seem to matter right now. All that matters is whether or not Elon Musk does indeed close the deal on Friday, as he says he will. Given the kind of environment we're talking about, assuming he succeeds in taking the company private, what do you think happens next? How does that business need to be altered in, and run in an environment competitively and economically like this? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think obviously we, we've already um, heard some hints that he's maybe thinking about some significant headcount cuts, so kind of um, trimming uh, the cost base substantially. He's obviously historically also talked about uh, a, some kind of subscription model uh, for that business too. So I think, yeah, particularly in light of a weaker uh, ad environment, I think there's always been issues about whether Twitter's really properly monetizing uh, its franchise in the ad space. Um, you know, I think a, a subscription model may well be something that we see under Elon Musk. Okay, Matt, thanks very much. Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence, thanks for bringing us up to date with all the themes from Tech. And coming up later today, an interview with the DoorDash CEO. That is going to be right here at 5 p.m. in New York time, uh, well, 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kayleigh Lines and Chrissy Gupta in New York. Matt Miller is off today. Now, Treasuries are extending gains from yesterday's close alongside the US dollar declining to its lowest level in three weeks. Our markets reporter Valerie Titel takes us through the dollar's recent descent and what it all means. Valerie, good morning. Is this just some position clearing out or do we get excited that we might once again be talking about the pivot word, P? Yeah, and I think traders were really caught off guard by the dollar's move weaker today. There was really a lack of a clear catalyst. I've got a chart here of the last four days of the dollar's descent. Uh, Friday, we had the BOJ intervention in the Wall Street Journal article uh, clamoring that, that the, uh, the Fed might step down to 50 in December. And then two days ago, then yesterday, we had the, the weak U.S. house price data. So the fall to overnight today basically mirrors the move we've had, and there was no clear catalyst, which shows that maybe the this was a positioning clear out. Maybe this pivot narrative is gaining steam. And I'm going to show you one more chart, which, which, which maybe is something we should be a bit concerned about. It is the correlation of the Bloomberg government bond index to the S&P. And my thesis here is that government bonds are beginning to trade like risk assets. And as this pivot narrative either picks up or falls away, whichever way we're headed, uh, government bonds and equities tend to move in the same direction. Risk tends to rally at the same time bond prices increase. Now, now the one thing that, that, is, that is shocking about all of this is when this correlation breaks down, that is the scary scenario. What if we have a situation where, where, the, where the Fed pivot comes, but then the inflation fight uh, it, it hadn't finished its inflation fight first, meaning we have a big equity equity risk bounce at the same mm -hmm. time bonds fall because inflation is entrenched. So, yes, we look at this and say the recent correlation is is shocking. It's high. We've never seen anything like this. But but to me, it's the real risk is when this new correlation breaks down. Yeah, it's a question of really if a Fed pivot is going to be bullish if it's happening because something is breaking. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel, thank you so much as always. And of course, you can see both of her great charts at GTV Go on the Bloomberg terminal. Finally, let's take a quick look at what else is ahead today. Tech earnings will continue with Twitter and Meta reporting sentiment not great going into those prints after the disappointing results from Microsoft and Alphabet yesterday. Then it's UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's first Prime Minister's questions. That's at 7 a.m. New York time. U.S. President Joe Biden will be holding holding a bilateral meeting with Isra the Israeli president, I Isaac Herzog, later today. And on the economic front, we'll get U.S. new home sales at 10 a.m. Eastern. That will be interesting after the housing data yesterday. That really was a catalyst for the bid we saw into the Treasury market. And finally, and most importantly, it is Anna's birthday today. So, <laughs> Anna, a very happy birthday to you from the entire early edition Thank you. Team. Well, I obviously know how to spend my time, don't I? What I got for my birthday is a stronger pound and some bank earnings to talk about, which is, of course, a thrill. Uh, Chrissy, interesting for markets to watch, though, what's going on in the UK politics space. I'm moving on. Uh, the UK <laughs> medium-term fiscal plan, it seems, is going to, according to the BBC, now we've got another report here. So we had the Times newspaper and now the BBC saying that this fiscal plan will be delayed from the 31st of October to November 17th. And Chrissy, what's important there is that takes it beyond the Bank of England meeting, which is due on November the 3rd. And I think what's also interesting here is at the same time, I believe we're also getting headlines that there is some suspicion that whatever plan uh, that Rishi Sunak is able to introduce will actually be smiled upon from the IMF, which just weeks ago said it was very concerned about the UK. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll continue to watch that carefully. And, and, and Kaylee, I know we'll be watching U.S. data. Really fascinating to see the way that the market is dealing with weakness in U.S. data, changing expectations just at the margin around what the Fed might do, as if sort of testing the waters around that narrative. Yeah, and you're definitely seeing that showing up in the bond market after a 14 basis point move lower on the 10-year yield yesterday. We're down another four basis points or so today. What's interesting is that even though bond yields are moving lower, it's not helping out equities because NASDAQ 100 futures still sharply mm. down after those weak earnings. So we'll look to see whether that story continues with the yeah. reports after the bell, Anna. Yeah, the big tech effect there. Uh, that is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. They'll be speaking to Mike Wilson, chief U.S. equity strategist at Morgan Stanley. What significance does he attach uh, to the weakness of the data? What does that mean for the Fed? We'll get his thoughts shortly. This is Bloomberg.